We've had nearly a thousand people take the online pledge to end the stigma associated with children's mental health. We also engaged key advocates across our community, several of whom are joining us here today. We provided resources to assist people with initiating a community conversation. Together, we created a wave of support through the events you attended, interaction on Facebook, Twitter, at our website, oneinfivminds.org, and public service announcements on TV. We did this because we all know that stigma creates silence, and silence creates barriers to care. In addition to building awareness, the One in Five Minds campaign hosted a conversation with Liza Long last year. Liza is the mother of a child with a mental illness. She wrote about her experience as a mom in response to the Newtown shootings. To hear Liza speak about her experiences in such an honest and open manner reinforce the need to continue to bring this message forward. And that brings us to our event today. This forum, an anniversary celebration, continues the conversation. As we're about to hear, it's a topic of critical importance because one in five children, that's one in every five, will suffer from a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder. For decades, children have gone untreated only to drop out of school, self-medicate with drugs and alcohol, or become incarcerated. All outcomes that don't have to happen if they just got treatment. One of the primary reasons they don't receive treatment is because they're uninsured or underinsured. Another is the lack of providers, especially for children and adolescents. We'll talk about that some more today. The panel is going to help us understand these issues and current state of mental health funding in Texas for children. We'll introduce them in a moment, along with our guest moderator, Evan Smith. But first, a word from our spot, no. First, <laughs> I'd like to thank our sponsors and acknowledge some special guests that are here today. Please join me in thanking Valero Energy Corporation for hosting us once again. Yay, Valero. <laughs> Valero and its foundation provides crucial support to thousands with a focus on children across our community. Please especially join me in thanking Sylvia Rodriguez, Vice President of the Valero Energy Foundation. Sylvia. Thank you also to Methodist Healthcare Ministries for underwriting the NowCast SA live stream that enables anyone with access to a computer to join in today's event. One of the focus areas of Methodist Healthcare Ministries is in fact mental health. Please join me in thanking Rebecca Brune, Vice President for Strategic Planning and Growth. Wait. And finally, thank you to NowCast SA and its dedicated leader who's back there working away, Charlotte Ann Lucas, for streaming this event. Nowcast SA is your local public television on the internet. Several community leaders have stepped forward to become advocates for children's mental illness. They have agreed to start the dialogue in the community by tweeting, posting on Facebook, emailing, and sharing the message of one in five minds with their friends, family, colleagues, and partners. We are pleased to recognize some of these advocates who have joined us here today. So please stand and remain standing as I call your name if you would. Uh, State Senator Letitia Vandepute is represented by Alexis Fonseca. Alexis. Uh, Le Dr. Deborah Healy, Director of Guidance and Counseling Services for the Northside Independent School District. Did Dr. Steve Pliska show up yet? Boy, is he gonna be in trouble. Jackie Vandewally, Lifetime Assistant Vice President for the San Antonio Livestock Exposition, which is also known as the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. And Justice Luz Elaine Chapa, Fourth Court of Appeals, who we will hear from momentarily. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and we have a few more special guests that we'd like to mention. First of all is Jennifer Deegan, Senior Health and Human Services Advisor, uh, representing Speaker of the House, Joe Strauss. 
she waved back there. Uh, Megan Regis, healthcare and social policy issues on behalf of State Representative Mike Villarreal. There she is. Uh, San Antonio Police Department Deputy Chief Joseph Mackay. Mm -hmm. We also have the ex executive director, uh, that wasn't the ex executive, it was the executive director of NAMI Texas, and that's Chris Scroggin. And we have also, uh, from the Fourth Court of Appeals, Judge Sandy Marion. So thank you, and thank you all for being here today. Everyone here plays a vital role in providing care for the children of our community. Because of your interest in children's mental health, we have set up a station to tell your story. It's located over there to my left, your right. If you would like to have your thoughts audio taped or your written message added to our newly redesigned oneinfiveminds.org website, just visit that area after the panel discussion. And now, it is my privilege to introduce one of our newest advocates with a heart for children's mental health. Justice Luz Elena Chapa was elected to serve on the fourth Court of Appeals effective January 1st, 2013, and is currently the youngest sitting justice in the state of Texas. Justice Chapa attended St. Mary's University where she received both her Bachelor of Arts in English and her law degree. Between law, college and law school, she headed to Capitol Hill where she interned for U.S. Congressman Lloyd Doggett and worked for the late U.S. Congressman Frank Tejeda. Justice Chapa is a Texas Bar Foundation Fellow and a 2014 inductee to the San Antonio Women's Hall of Fame. Her civic activities include mentoring students at Healy Murphy Center, where she serves as vice president of the board, and serving on the boards of the St. Mary's Law Alumni Association and the Center for Family Relations. She is a proud member of Impact San Antonio and is an official advocate for One in Five Minds. Justice Chapa has been married to Miguel for 11 years, and they have two daughters. Please join me in welcoming Justice Luz Elena Chapa to the podium. I will not trip on purpose. <laughs> Good morning. Meet Michael. Michael grew up on the Texas border in a middle class family with college educated parents, a sister, a twin brother, and a large extended family. As a child, he was funny, loving, respectful, and intellectually surpassed children his age. He was accepted into the gifted and talented program at the age of eight years old. His analytical and math skills were off the charts. Not only was he smart, he was athletic too. Making a home run was a piece of cake for Michael, winning first place at a swim meet, no sweat. And not only was Michael intelligent and athletic, he was tall and handsome, with dirty blonde hair and hazel eyes. There was no doubt that Michael was growing to grow up to be a heartthrob who excelled in AP classes all while winning state championships. Academic and athletic college scholarships would be in close reach. He indeed had a bright future. But then something changed in his behavior and his demeanor and level of commitment to himself, his family, and his studies. Countless number of doctors told his mother that it was a phase. He was simply a rebellious teenager trying to test boundaries. Stand firm, they told her. Teachers said it was common for gr boys growing up on the border to go across and partake in early age drinking and perhaps even smoke marijuana on occasion. No big deal, it's just a phase. Michael, he'll grow out of it. You see, there was nothing for Michael to grow out of. You can't choose to grow out of schizophrenia. It was a part of him during his teen years and will be a part of him for the rest of his life. Michael is now 30 years old and he is still the same loving, funny, respectful, and intellectually brilliant young man. He has a deep and strong faith in God, but he is tired of being sick. He is so tired of being sick. 
He is tired of not finding the right medication that will completely silence the voices that torment him. He is tired of not being able to finish his college education, although he has completed 60 hours. Not because he doesn't have the intellectual capability of doing so, but because he does not have the mental stability he so desperately desires. He is tired of not having a job and, be, and he's tired of being dependent on his 66-year-old mother for everything. He is tired of being someone a prisoner in his own home because there are no programs. There are no programs that benefit someone like him, none. There is no place for him to go without feeling the stigma that is associated with mental illness, especially someone who has schizophrenia. The one mental illness that I feel is on the bottom of the priority list. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so proud and honored to say that Michael is my 30-year-old brother. I love him dearly. I love him dearly, but there's not a day that goes by that I pray for him and that I wish for someone or something to cure his schizophrenia, not because I'm ashamed, not because I'm embarrassed, but because I want him to have a life he can actually be happy about living. I carry an insurmountable amount of guilt. Why? Because I never asked him why he was drinking alcohol or smoking marijuana at the age of 14. To the contrary, I used to get mad at him and I judged him. I never asked why. Perhaps if I had, had asked, we would, all know, we would all have known that he was self-medicating because he didn't know how how to handle or cope with the, what was going on in his head. He didn't know how to communicate it, but more importantly, us as a family, we didn't know anything else but to say that alcohol and drug abuse were not accepted in our home. We all stood firm. I have no medical background, nor am I an expert. But ladies and gentlemen, what I do know is that my brother would be in a much different place today had he had an early diagnosis, had he been treated early, and had he, had, had, had he been accepted early on, I often wonder what would have happened if he had had this early diagnosis. This is why funding for children's mental health needs is so crucial and so vital to our community, and not to mention across the state of Texas. I often wonder if he had indeed benefited at an early age rather than at the age of 18 or 19, would his schizophrenia have manifested and spiraled out of control? Would an early diagnosis have kept him from self-medicating? Would it have kept him out of the court system? I wholeheartedly believe that yes, it would have made a huge difference. Because half of all chronic mental illness begins at age 14, three quarter of illnesses by age 24. There are long delays before the first appearance of symptoms and beginning of treatment. Specifically here in Bear County, every year, 1,300 children are admitted to a local ER for psychiatric reasons. Depression, suicidal thoughts, and bipolar disorder are far too common. 50% of children with a serious emotional disturbance drop out of high school, and children who go untreated are twice as likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. Thankfully, Michael hasn't used alcohol or marijuana in years because he knows how to cope now and we know how to communicate with him much better. Here are some all too real statistics provided by Clarity. In 2009, 171 Texas counties did not have a single psychiatrist. 102 counties did not have a psychologist. And 48 counties in our great state of Texas did not have a single licensed professional counselor. While studies show that approximately 14 child and adolescent psychiatrists per 100,000 youth are needed, Texas has less, ha less than half that number, with approximately six child adolescent psychiatrists per 100,000 youth. Most of them are concentrated in urban areas. In San Antonio, the rate is 7.53. Yes, still much less than the needed number of psychiatrists, and generally, it takes three to six months to see one. In 2010, only six child psychiatrists served a population of 814,578,000 in the border region. 
These numbers, they sound disturbing. I, they're disturbing to me. I hope they're disturbing to you. And much more can be done to improve the mental health care available to our community's children. Undoubtedly, the conversation has begun, and we are making progress. But I am cautiously optimistic because the progress is a slow one. More often than not, the issues of children's mental health needs gets politicized. And those who truly need the help, they're no longer the focus. For those of you who have not visited Clarity's campus, I encourage you to do so. It is such a remarkable place. The reputable, reputable and caring physicians and staff create a sense of being at home. There is, there is a sense of peace in knowing that the children who walk in and out of its doors are given the best quality care and attention that these children deserve. These children do deserve the best care. Clarity is one that gives children and their families hope of achieving a stable, normal, and happy life. Because I think we all do want to achieve stability in these situations. Clarity is one that I wish was on every street corner in the state of Texas. Imagine if we had a Clarity campus in every big town that was close to people who could just drive and go to Clarity. There wasn't a three to six month waiting list. And young children wouldn't start to self-medicate. Imagine the difference that could be. <clears throat> but early diagnosis and early treatment alone are not enough. Acceptance of the diagnosis is a must. Acceptance. Acceptance. Embrace it. That's, that's the biggest step ever. Because if you are affected by a family member who has a mental illness, you need to come forward and you need to partake in this conversation. It's just too important to ignore. More often than not, parents are in denial and they do not want to accept that their child might have a mental illness. Shame and embarrassment associated with mental illness is all too vivid and real. Society's lack of acceptance of children with mental illness keeps parents from coming forward. I get it, I do, it hits home. But I will tell you this, the more we share, the more we learn. Sharing our stories only benefits those who are confronted with the issue of mental illness. And let me be perfectly clear. There is nothing shameful or embarrassing about having a brother with schizophrenia. He did not choose to have this illness. It chose him. In my eyes, he is a normal 30-year-old male who happens to have schizophrenia, just like someone happens to have cancer or happens to have diabetes or Down syndrome or autism. It's all one and the same for me. Naturally, my mother is Michael's number one advocate, and she has never been in denial. She has tirelessly advocated for him throughout his entire life and continues to do so every single day. At times, I'm exhausted by watching her do it. Yes, she's 66 years old, and Michael depends on her for everything, and I'm not sure what the future holds for Michael. He is fully insured has been in and out of hospitals, and has been seen by leading medical professionals across the country. You would think by now he would have achieved mental stability. You would, have, you would think by now he would have found the right medication. But there are no real answers and no medication exists that has stabilized his mental health without, without having serious side effects. And yet my mother, she remains hopeful. Today is the first time I speak publicly about how my family has been affected. I have been thanked and told I was courageous about speaking here today. But let me set the record straight. I am not the courageous one. Michael is the courageous one for giving me permission to do so. My mother is the brave and courageous one for giving me her blessing and for encouraging me to be here today. And this is all in an effort for other families to start coming forward, to start joining the conversation. We are all dealing with the same issues, regardless of where we come from, regardless of our stature, financial stability, economic situation at home. We are all doing this together, and we now need to join forces. I ask that each of you open your hearts and your minds to the discussion that will take place here this morning. My hope is that you will leave here with a new sense of a personal mission, at a minimum, help lessen the stigma, one day at a time, one child at a time. Because we all know that it's going to take moving mountains to end the stigma altogether. But if we can do our part and lessen it a bit, I think we're headed in the right direction. How can you help lessen the stigma? It's quite simple. As Fred mentioned, go to the website, take the pledge, 
It's free. You have no commitment other than um, to take the pledge. And there's actually a little icon that you can share on your Facebook, um, for, if you're a member of Facebook. It will take you to your, your page and you will show your friends, your family, your coworkers that you have taken the pledge and they hopefully will follow by your example. I encourage you to do it today. In fact, maybe we should um, have a little stand out here and make everyone do it before they leave if you haven't done so already. <laughs> I'm sure we can manage that. Valero has been so gracious in hosting. We can set up another table. But in any event, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> also, um, help me encourage others to stop using certain vocabulary. Certain words, they sting. Schizo is one of my words that makes my skin crawl. She's mental. He's psycho. Using the term bipolar in a derogatory way have no business in our everyday conversations. Help me set the example as I ask, and I know others will follow you. I extend my most heartfelt gratitude to everyone at Clarity Child Guidance Center and those associated with the One in Five Minds program for inviting me here to share some personal thoughts. I especially commend them in their efforts to create more public awareness about our community's children's mental health needs, not only in Bear County, but across the state of Texas. And more importantly, I congratulate them for creating and continuing a conversation to end the stigma that we all know strongly exists in our society and everyday lives. Congratulations on your campaign's one year anniversary. I am extremely honored to be an official advocate for the One in Five Minds program. And I am wholeheartedly committed to your mission. I also thank Valero for hosting us today and for, this wasn't on my notes, for um, Methodist, Help me. <laughs> Methodist Healthcare Ministries um, for your support as well. And for now, CAST SA uh, for streamlining. To each and every one of you um, who are here today who hasn't actually been affected by someone with a mental illness, I applaud you for coming, for showing your support, because it will take people like you who haven't been fit, um, personally affected by it to help lessen the stigma. The more we talk about it, the more we become comfortable with the conversation. Thank you for listening to Michael's story. I hope it inspires you to take the pledge to help end the stigma associated with mental illness. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Chapa, for your heartfelt words and your dedication to the children in our community. Uh, it's not just us, it, it's people like her that can stand up and say this and make a difference in the long term. Uh, just as, as a minor thank you, uh, we have a pendant here that was designed by renowned jeweler Jeep Collins uh, of our pinwheel and uh, it is our symbol of hope and healing and uh, the hope and healing that's made possible by children when they actually receive treatment. So just a minor thing. Thank you so much. And now, it's time to hear from our panel of professionals. This event is being streamed on the internet right now and will be available later for viewing through the support of NowCast SA. If you are tweeting or posting about the event, join us with hashtag, and I gotta get this right, fund TXMH. As I introduce each panelist, please join us on stage. First is Ed Dickey, Vice President of the Texas Board of Directors, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Ed. <laughs> Melissa Rowan, Healthcare Policy Director for the Texas Council of Community Centers. <laughs> Dr.
Dr. John Thies, Chair-Elect, Mental Health America of Texas. And Stacy Wilson, Associate General Counsel for the Texas Hospital Association. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Evan Smith, and I've already put my foot in my mouth with Evan this morning by telling him that the Texas Tribune is the second thing I read every morning. Oh. <laughs> uh, being an old guy, I have read a newspaper every single morning as soon as I got out of bed and sat down to eat my breakfast. And uh, I do get that newspaper out of the front yard before I get to the uh, computer, so I apologize about that. <laughs> Evan is the editor-in-chief and CEO of the Texas Tribune, a nonprofit digital news organization based in Austin. The Tribune's deep coverage of Texas politics and public policy can be found on their website, texastribune.org. In the pages of the New York Times, and in the newspapers, and on TV and radio stations across the state. In four years of operation, the Tribune has won four Edward R. Murrow Awards from the Radio Television Digital News Association, two General Excellence Awards, and an award for innovation in journalism. Before co-founding the Tribune, Evans spent nearly 18 years at Texas Monthly, including eight years as editor and a year as president and editor-in-chief. On his watch, Texas Monthly won the National Magazine Award for General Excellence twice. Please join me in welcoming Evan Smith. Thank you. Hello, panelists, hello, good to see you. Morning. Glad you're here. We're gonna have a conversation about a couple of issues related to mental health policy and at a certain point uh, in our time together, we're gonna open the floor up for questions from the audience. We'll ask that you uh, think up good questions during the time we're together and when you get up to ask your questions, the only request we have is please no speeches. Uh, we'd like to use the time we have for as many questions as possible. Um, let me uh, ask, uh, of our panelists a, a general question to begin. Uh, I know each of you has thought uh, hard about this and works on this uh, sort of thing every day. What is the most important issue in, in, in children's mental health right now? Different people coming from different perspectives are apt to have uh, different answers. Uh, Stacy, you're here representing the Hospital Association. You understand from the provider side the sorts of things that you see coming through the pipeline every day. Tell us what you identify as the single most important issue in children's mental health now. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, one of the important things, in addition to stigma, that um, Justice Chavez pointed out is we are seeing a really big problem with readmissions for children with, readmissions. For, with mental health and substance abuse. Right. There, there was a report from um, uh, in the Medicaid program for state fiscal year 2012 that showed that readmissions for, for children with mental health conditions um, was at least twice as high as readmissions for other types of conditions. Why do you think that is? Who owns that problem? Well, I think it's a combination. I think as um, all problems are all of ours. Yep. So I think there's a problem with not being enough community mental health services to, yep. to do a soft handoff to, to right. ensure that that patient, that child gets the treatment that they need. Yep. And I think there's a problem probably from the hospital perspective of not trying to make that connection. I think different hospitals obviously do it better sure. than others. Um, but I think one of the wonderful things that this waiver is allowing us to do, there's a Medicaid, and, a Medicaid waiver that's allowing us to do things that you're, people are nodding their heads in the audience. Right. Um, you're talking to a hometown crowd as far as I, that Yeah, that's that a home. good thing. <laughs> right. um, but I think one of the big things that it's letting us do is collaborate, trying to break down those, those silos good. of talking to one another, and I think that's a good place well, to let's start. Well, we're going to ask about the right. waiver specifically in a bit. Ms. Rowan, what do you think uh, is the most important issue right now in children's health? Well, I think to, to pinpoint one issue is tough when I, right. I, I talk to oh, some but experts I'm ask you and to they do it. said, oh, so give, one. Us, give us one. Um, but I think when you see the statistic that uh, fewer than one-third of Texas children and youth receive the mental health services that they need, right. I think that you have to say access to, um, to services is the, the primary issue. Right. It's usually related to cost of care, stigma around receiving help, and also the availability of professionals. So I think as we look to see what we can do to yeah. kind of address those problems, those are the things that we're going to have to talk about. Right. Dr. Thies, tell, to give us your, your sense of what the most important issue is in children's well, health. From, from an advocacy point of view, stigma is at the heart of our stigma. poor reactions right. to mental disease. We're quick to support individuals and families who have physical health problems, yep. but 
we have fears about people who act differently. And, and some people believe that it's a personal, a mental illness is a personal flaw. Um, and so an education effort on behalf of, uh, of, of this idea that we have to regard uh, people who have issues with mental health in a certain way, perhaps differently from how we've regarded them in the past, right? We, we, we need to be taught how to think about mental illness maybe differently than the way we've been taught. Right, and I, and I think one of the one point that I could make that I think is critically important in that education process <laughs> right. is the whole idea of when we hear something that's not true, we need to speak up. Yeah. We need to be in a crowd, in a small group, with an individual, yeah. speak up and speak to the issue, speak to your opinion, speak to your facts that support that opinion, right. and be careful not to attack the person. And then you've put information on the table, then you've begun the process of changing how people think. Indeed. Uh, Ed, jump in here, what do you think? Most From the family issue. perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, personally, mm -hmm. but I will also say I'm in contact with one to two families per week right. call my home. Yep. The first question they ask, where do I find help? Where do I go? Where do I go? Right. How do I begin? Uh, I, I get a call and someone says, uh, I got a, an appointment for my son, 11-year-old uh, son, three months away. Yeah. What do I do in between that time? Right. Uh, parents are not educated. Uh, about right, so what to back, recognize, to education, in a education different way, right? yeah. and that goes back to stigma, right. but it goes back to the whole idea, where do we start? Where do we begin? Yeah. We're confronted at a point of trauma. Yeah. We're confronted as a family member at a point of crisis. Right. When my family is to some degree still functional, yeah. working together, uh, pleasantly interacting, yeah. I don't as a father recognize some difficulties or relate them right. to an illness possibility. Uh, and so, so, so what you heard so very much, moving, moving story yeah. from Justice Shapa about her family, this is a family I story that you, connect. you, you know I mean, the it's, story. It's, we're in the same family. Right. It, it is a personal connection. Yeah. We lived it. I right. lived it myself, my right. wife and I. Uh, I'm a, an accountant. My wife is a nurse. We are somewhat educated right. and felt like we should be able to recognize these things. But in reality, we did not. Did not. We did not understand right. the connections. And there was no one out in the community yeah. to help us understand those and connections. And accepting, Ed, the fact that people come from different backgrounds or in different situations. There's probably a racial or ethnic aspect to this. Yes. There's probably a difference in socioeconomic uh, uh, groupings yeah. of folks that some people who are people of more means may have better access and better information, better education about uh, places they can turn, and it may not be the case in uh, that. In that is true to a yeah. degree, though, Evan. Yeah. Even people who have a financial means, yeah. uh, people who have good jobs. Maybe they don't know uh, as much as they might know. We don't recognize the problem until right. we get a record from the police department that right. our son was delinquent, until right. we hear from the school that our daughter is skipping classes, yeah. until some type of crisis comes into play. Got it. Uh, when we are new parents, before we ever have a child, we're introduced by the community as to what's going to happen when our child is born, as to what to expect. When we are new parents then, we're given an education about uh, these are the types of, of uh, uh, shots that your child should have. This is the kind of uh, regular appointment that you should keep your child connected to your pediatrician with. Yeah. But we don't hear about <clears throat> mental health. Right. Um, it's not assumed that we should know that. Right. Right. Uh, Ms. Rowan, so we hear the challenges, right? Everybody's offered the, what the challenges we face are. are. Uh, tell us what's being done, what has been done to improve uh, mental health in, in, uh, for children in Texas. Give us a concrete thing that you're aware has happened that would be a, a, a step in the right direction, progress, that we can point to. Um, I think some progress, particularly in this area, mm -hmm. the legislature passed two bills, um, Senate Bill 460 and House Bill 3793, yep. that both put an emphasis on the importance of knowledge for teachers and other school professionals right. around mental health. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think the acknowledgement that that's where our kids are every day, that those doors are open, that those people really 
know our kids and we have they, to involve them in the solution they have to know they have to have mental basic mental health awareness training they have to be able to know like they think something's going on but they're not sure and that kind of training that they're going to get really helps them to say there is something here the red flag means something and then also what do i do with that mm -hmm. so that they can help actually say to a child right know what to say Right. Because I've talked um, with some mental health first aid trainers, um, and one in particular ha is an adult with a lived experience of mental illness. And she says, looking back, as a child, she really struggled. And she knows that her teachers knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And no one ever said anything to right. her. And she said, I know now, they didn't know what to say. They had no idea what would be an appropriate thing to say to right. a child struggling the way she So that's does. a meaningful piece, so piece of legislation that'll, that'll move the needle. Uh, tell us, Dr. Thies, what, what's a, 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 something you could point to that's a positive step that's been taken to improve? Well, while we're relatively poorly funded, we have potential for great progress in this area. We've got access to mental health first aid training. We have recognition and training resources for teachers and staff, as you mentioned. We have uh, early childhood intervention services, yep. all of which were initiated or expanded in this last legislative session. Mm -hmm. What we're missing is the social will to fund these services, to engage right. these Sadly, services. you can't legislate that, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You can't legislate social will. Absolutely. Right. But, uh, but you, you, like Ms. Rowan, you believe that out of the last legislative session, a lot of good things actually happened. Oh, absolutely. I mean, right. we, we have inched forward since the 2003 session, and I think we made the greatest steps in the last yeah. session, right. but we're still way down on the list. Stacy, this may down. be the nicest things that people have said about our legislature in a long time. <laughs> in, in, one, in one sitting, we work around the legislature a little bit. We know what the normal wrap on that building is. What, what, what would you point to as a positive step that uh, in the last little while that you'd say would represent progress? Sure. In, in addition to the, the things that have been pointed out, um, House Bill 3793 also requires the Department of State Health Services to look at what is the need. What is the need? What are the current resources available? And then what's the gap? How do we fund that gap? Because until you can quantify what services we don't have, you can't go to the legislature and ask for the money. Doesn't mean they'll give it to you. But at least you have a quantifiable impact that you can say, we need X more you know, services in, the, in, the, um, in this area or right. that area. The other thing that I will commend them for is um, House Bill 1023 requires a study of what the needed workforce is in mental health. You heard um, Justice Chapa talk about the horrible statistics in Texas. Um, I think 241 counties um, are a health professional service shortage area in mental yep. health in one way or another. Um, and that's that's horrible. I mean, we can't, clearly you can't serve people if you don't have the workforce to do it. You don't have the do workforce it. to do it. So at least House Bill 1023, again, it's a step. It's quantifying what we need, to what we have, and then Good. what we need. Ed, what do you say? Give us a concrete step in the right direction. I think uh, something that I saw through the legislation this past uh, session right. uh, that was really encouraging to me uh, was the emphasis placed on early detection, early understanding. Right. Uh, as Justice Chapa pointed out, uh, when we catch a child's issues right. early, we know a large portion of illnesses begin at age 14. Yeah. When we recognize, catch it early, then we can have such a more positive... You start dealing with out. it early, right. That's yeah. exactly correct. Right. And our own son, you know, we saw his illnesses emerge as a young child. His first hospitalization was here at Clarity at the age of eight. Yep. Several con he continued with several hospitalizations through his elementary, uh, uh, middle school, and high school experience. But today he is functioning extremely Made successfully. Made a big difference that you had access and to that so information. It's exactly right. right. And so we all children need to have that access and need to have that opportunity. We're moving in the right direction. But our services are still provided in silos. Yeah, I get that. You know, right. we, we need to put this together. We need handoff. When yeah. our at one hospitalization, our son was in for an extended period of time during right. the school year. And when he went back to the school setting, it seemed that the information provided at one point in the school didn't connect didn't to anyone else. Yeah. 
And, and this is extremely right. um, difficult. Got that. Now, Stacy, I'm going to go back to what you said earlier about the waiver. And I'm interested to hear that in all the discussion of positive things that have happened recently and all that happy talk about the legislature, nobody actually said, well, the legislature actually gave us a bunch more money than we were expecting, right? Uh, rare these days in times of austerity, even with money flowing into the state's bank account, to see so much money uh, come back out in the form of... Um, uh, of, of funding for programs like we, there more than three hundred million dollars allocated. I think cool. you all are expecting probably half that amount to come. Right. So you've got all this new funding. You've got access to this waiver. You've got sort of possibility and hope on the horizon. What What do you do with it? What's the What's the highest and best use of all this additional uh, uh, available money? Um, well, I think one of the great things that's being done is we're trying to, number one, train more providers. We need more psychiatrists. There are additional residency programs that are yep. being funded. Um, hospitals are doing about 73 um, behavioral health projects over the first couple of, of years in the waiver. Um, I think one of the ways that we can start talking about mental health, because last time I checked, the brain and the mind are still part of the body, is to integrate the, the delivery of physical care and mental health. Because yeah. I think if you can do primary care and mental health together, number one, we're not treating it separately. We're treating it as part of your, well, child visit. Or right. we're treating it, you know, and that means you've got to have either through telemedicine or some other way, you've got to have that behavioral health component inside a primary care setting. Yeah. Or the primary care setting, in, I mean, the primary care inside um, the behavioral health setting. Yeah. And I think that's going to help reduce stigma. There is a lot of there are a lot of projects going on to integrate the delivery of primary care and behavioral health, and I think that's going to help right. as well. Uh, Melissa, money doesn't solve every problem, but it's certainly easier to but solve problems nice when to you have. have access to those resources. <laughs> and there are probably some people who say, "Well, yes, it's wonderful to celebrate more than three hundred million dollars come back into our mental health. We would have preferred to have more, even." So theoretically, some things are not going to get done, even though you've got more money than you thought. But what's the best way to spend the money that you've now got available to you? I think particularly in children's services, what we're seeing is a build out of a continuum. So what we have now, if you're a parent, you have maybe some options for outpatient care, yep. and then you have inpatient care. And we haven't always had a lot in between that. And so what we're seeing in the 1115 okay. and in some of the projects funded by the legislature is building out uh, crisis services, building out residential treatment. So for example, one this of is the, a bridge. Maybe, it's right? the bridge. Yeah. So that, um, for example, one of our, uh, one of the 1115 projects is a therapeutic foster care treatment program. Yep. And so when a child's in crisis, instead of them having to go into an inpatient setting or a juvenile justice facility, they have an option to go into a trained foster care home mm -hmm. where crisis is resolved, family stability is regained, treatment started, and then they go back home. And so maybe they're, you know, 30 or 45 days in a different setting, yeah. but they're not, they're still in a, in a home-like setting and they're not in an, an institutional level of care. Ed, what, do you, what would you say the money will mean and what can be done with it to make the biggest impact? I think the money is, is everything yeah. uh, because that's what opens up interest, that's what opens up services. Uh, when Texas starts paying for services, then businesses will come. Texas is so a very... So you actually think that from an economic... That's interesting. Let me stop you for a second. You mm -hmm. think from an economic development... We love to brag about our economic yeah. development in the state. Yes. We run around the state, pick, run around the country, pardon me, pickpocketing businesses from right. other states saying, come to Texas. We have all these wonderful conditions that would make it favorable. But you think actually adequate mental health services, adequately funded mental health services would be another arrow in that quiver. Absolutely. From an economic I truly do. Standpoint. And the money that was appropriated yeah. by the legislatures, yeah. and it was up to something like 300, over $300 million. Right. Right. That's significant. Yeah. That talks Sends a message. to businesses. Yeah. That tells business, oh, maybe I can make a difference here then. Maybe right. I can survive and still provide a support. Uh, it, it is huge. Yeah. Uh, there are There is a residential treatment facility near Victoria. Right. Um, great facility. Uh, it's extremely expensive. Most of their patients are out of state because Texas doesn't pay for residential treatment mm -hmm. until now. Now right. they will start paying for residential treatment. That is something that is sorely needed, especially for children. You can deal with a crisis on occasion yep. in a short period of time through a short hospitalization. Mm -hmm. But there are some cases when a child needs an extended care. Um, residential treatment is one resource for that. And the legislature appropriated funds 
for I think it was like 10 beds. Yeah. And, and even on my mind, I heard the dollar value associated with that, and I don't recall the dollar value, and I thought, oh great, that's good money. And then I heard 10 beds. <laughs> that's an opportunity for expansion. Right. But it is the right direction. Well, you're never going to get everything you want, but you well, know, but figure, out, figure right out at least, you know, can we claim victory at least in Absolutely. terms of heading in the Absolutely. right direction? Dr. Thies, what, what would you say the, the, the biggest impact of the money could potentially be? More importantly, I think we need to put that money in perspective as to how we got it. We started 10 years ago with an initiative right. that said crisis funding will make a difference. Crisis funding made a difference. Yes. The police are on board. The emergency rooms are right. on board. The coalition grew. The education of the legislature grew. The number of people who were in lobbying for those funds right. grew. That's how we got that money. That's how we're going to get more. And we need to show that this money paid off in terms of social stability and in terms of the economy. So you think actually we have to, t however we spend this money, one of the most important things is to spend it in a way that has a visible uh, impact or consequence because unless you do, then people come back next time and they say, well, you didn't really use what was given to you the last time, so why should we give you more? Absolutely, yeah. and it's important to notice that there isn't much in the way of funding to do this at the state level. Right. This is a local issue. This is your new programs, your new initiatives right. have to be looked at by you evaluated by you and reported back to legislators right. by you. Yeah, it's an interesting point because really these days in terms of funding of social services or just about anything that the state once had as its purview exclusively, everything is state local now. Everything is public private. So we really are, we're in kind of partnership mode, whether it's partnership between the state and communities or a partnership between the public side and the private side of things. We're not gonna accomplish these things just one way. Right, right. And, and that partnership is how we got that money. Yeah a piece of that partnership right. and we need to continue to continue grow that. it. So, so that actually gets to the next question, which is, you know, you've seen the, the, the effectiveness. Let's, let's, metrics for success. Um, uh, what, what do you do to demonstrate that these changes you might make, Stacy? got this money, you want to go, go forward with any of the good ideas you've had. How do you demonstrate upstream that this, the, the, this money was spent wisely, that this money was used effectively? Because the theory, and we'll ask about this in a second, you've got another legislative session uh, you know, less than a year from now, we'll gavel in in Austin, and you obviously would like to, to roll that progress forward into the next thing. So now it's crucial that you demonstrate effectiveness. How do you do that? Um, well, I think given the fact that our legislature is relatively conservative, um, you talk about cost avoidance. You that talk wasn't a very big, I expected more yeah. of a giggle than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that's a, that is an undeniable fact. And, I, and it could become even yeah. more conservative depending yeah. on what happens in this election. So everyone go vote. That's my big story on that. But <laughs> well, you're not advocating for certain outcomes, are no, you? Because we'll I, all no. have to exit everybody, the stage immediately. If everybody, okay. everybody go vote. For however you want to vote, go just vote. Just be sure But you just vote. go exercise that right, right that you have. Yeah. Um, but, but I think that it's going to be data. You know, these, our legislators are very data driven. Right. And so to the extent that you can show that you reduce the number of state hospitalizations, you reduce the impact on an emergency department, um, you reduce the impact on law enforcement, you know, how, how have you gotten people served in the least restrictive setting with the best outcomes? Right. And, and we have to have data to show that. And if we don't, because their stories are delightful and right. they're wonderful and they show it, but until you put paper Actual in front number, of those guys numbers on paper, they and don't, ladies, they don't, yeah, they're, they don't, not they don't gonna, they're not going to listen Dr. Thies, the reality is this is not a very lo long amount of time that you have to demonstrate this progress before we get into another legislative session. Can there actually be a meaningful impact to be demonstrated in this short time frame? I believe so, with good community engagement. We've had a number of efforts at the legislature yeah. to produce statistics, to give local areas information, and they've consistently failed. And we have a new piece of legislation, actually it's in two different bills, but the big one is uh, House Bill, oh no, Senate Bill 58. And it basically requires the Department of State Health Services to provide us with performance statistics locally based on the web and distributed where we can see them and access so them. So a dashboard. A dashboard, right. absolutely. Now the quality of that dashboard is going to vary and it's going to vary based on whether we look at it and whether yeah. we use it yeah. and whether we take the information that we get from that 
into a voting booth because that's what's going to make the difference. Stigmas at the base. Change that, change perception, change the way people see the economic value of treating mental illness, and we will get where we need to go. Right. Uh, Ms. Rowan, tell me what uh, success looks like here. What are the metrics that would demonstrate effectiveness adequately to? I think fortunately the way the 1115 transformation waiver yeah. works with the federal government is providers get paid for performance on metrics. And so we are collecting data. There is accountability. There is accountability. Right. And so we have data, both, uh, you know, kind of process data and outcomes data required reporting to get yeah. paid for any of these programs. Okay. And so I think we're going to have a data set that we haven't had before. Good. We do want to be able to point out that it's early in some of these projects, but what we can say is this is the data we have now, and then here are our goals you, for where we're heading. And if you model headed. based on what we've seen so far, uh, Ed, then you can actually project out even more success. Right. And in the end, that may be en enough, uh, that may be suitable to the, to the task here, right? And actually, I'm an accountant by training. You understand and little numbers so and little boxes. I can't argue with any of this. As well as anybody. The, the right. numbers are important. Yeah and especially to our legislators, uh, and rightfully so. They right. want to see results, and we right. as, as taxpayers yeah. expect that. They're going to be them. held accountable, so they need to hold you accountable. But I still value tremendously the changed lives. Right. The change in family life, the yeah. change in direction yeah. that, that uh, families living with mental illness are able to to see right. that is still necessary. So the, yeah, the, anecdotes, the anecdotes matter because they, they yes. put a human face on the issue. It's not about statistics versus uh, anecdotes. It's oh, both and. Correct. Right, not either Absolutely. or. So we have a little bit of time left before we open it up to questions from the audience. Let me ask each of you, let me start down here and we'll come add all the way down to Stacy. Um, you have the ear of the legislature, let's just say. 2015 session, gavels in, second week of January of next year. Uh, without really knowing what the outcome of the fall elections are. Stuff doesn't really change. A couple people on one side or the other. It's basically the legislature that you've got now is what you're going to have uh, next time. Some different nameplates, but more or less the politics are going to be the same politics. So going into the session, what's your wish? What's the one thing you want them to, to take in there with them that you'll be advocating for I on, would like, on this issue? I would like them to understand yeah. that mental illness is a normal illness a normal right. ailment that afflicts the human nature. Right. Unlo you know, it, not it clearly is. it's not the same as every other ailment, but we shouldn't make it so much the other. That is right. Right. It, it's just a normal condition of right. being human. Yeah. And we need to respond accordingly. So we're going to normalize it, basically. Absolutely. You know, as, as, we as you would talk about everything else. Not just the right. families who live it. Right. We educate the entire community yeah. so that when my son, with the supports that he's receiving behind yeah. our front door, right. is able to walk through that door into our neighborhood and right. receive reciprocal, similar type of support from our neighbors. Right. That was Justice Chappas' point. One of the points I thought yes. was we have to start thinking about mental illness like we think about cancer. That is right. Or as we think about diabetes. Basically, think of it as just another affliction, serious. Let's not minimize the seriousness of it, but don't make it the other. Right. Don't that, stigmatize it. That actually it. helps. Uh, Ms. Rowan, what would you say going into that building, pink building, next, uh, next January? What do you want them to think about? Well, I would say that I would hope we don't wait until January to go into the building um, because... I, I well, some of us have to work on covering this stuff, so we share right. your hope that, um, they could, that they're there sooner. But yeah. let's just play this out. I really so think, you know, from an Austin-based organization, we're not going to be the ones that make the impact. It's going to be people like you in your community meeting with your members now yeah. yes. to make sure that they understand your story. And I do think the data is really important, but what we do find is that what has the most meaning for many members is to have a local constituent explain to them what their struggles have been in their right. families and, and what they need to be supported to be successful in their community. So you would say to people, take up uh, these folks on the opportunity, on the invitation to go see them. Absolutely. Right? You're essentially citizen lobbyists, right? You're going to go see your, your members and you're going to say, this is why this is important. You will be the difference between whether they stay engaged or whether they think they've solved or, the problem. Or, or not. Dr. Thies, what would you say going into next January is a big thing that they should be thinking about? Well, one of the things that, that I have learned from the Mental Health America of Texas staff really is that citizens need to stay informed. We need to work together. 
We need to speak with one voice because yep. that's how we get results. Yep. Crying out as individuals only confuses the issue. We need to know who each other are. Collective action. Exactly. If, yep. if you go in and give three different people, give the same story from three different perspectives, you have lost that legislator. Right. So your advice then would be what? To band together, to work together, to support your community. So your something community. A more traditional and, organization. Well, I, NAMI and um, Mental Health America of Texas are key advocates right. in this state. Right. We have branches and affiliates right. throughout the state. Right. Work with them. Yeah. Feed up through us. Let us feed right. back to you guys so that we're all using the same nomenclature so that we appear to know right. what we're talking Power about. Power and numbers. Right. I get that. Stacy, the last uh, uh, comment f uh, from you. You know the challenges that the state always has going into a legislative session. Um, finite amount of money, public education, higher education, health care in general, costs of health care are spiraling upward, threatening to overtake uh, the budget. Um, enormous challenges in a fast-growing state. How do you say to people when all that uh, is going on, whenever all these other things are on people's radar screens, stop, pay attention to this? What do you, how do you do that? And I think um, I, I think it's important. The point that you made that you need a story and you need the data. Yep. You need both of those things. Both. We always said when we went to go talk to a legislator, you need a hook. What's the story that we can tell that that legislator, every time that issue is going to come up, is going to remember Michael? Yep. Or is going to remember, and they're going to go, oh, that's oh. important to a constituent because. Mm -hmm. um, I think John is absolutely dead on that we need to have one message. Because if you come in with multiple messages, they've got 140 days, and they throw up their hands, and they go, you right. know what? At this point, public education is simpler. Much more important and simpler to, and simpler to fix. And when public education is simpler to fix. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So Watch out. What, what we've been saying is, is that what they did last session with the $332 million was an excellent first step. And they, they need to build but on that. But it was that. only one step. It was only one step. If you have one piece of candy in a candy bowl and you get two pieces of candy, yes, you've increased that by 100%, but you only have two, two pieces right, of yeah. candy. And that's kind of the, you know, the theory about they have so poorly underfunded mental health for so long that this is, you know, it's great, and we're not going to say, please don't give us the money, but it's a step. Got to be a step. Okay. Stepping stone. Good. A good conversation that sort of sets the table. I hope for good conversation that will come audience up to the stage. So we are going to ask that you join in here. Um, do we have any amplification for our questioners? Both sides. We have a microphone over there on the end, and we'll ask that you line up on either side, one, two. We're going to take as many questions as we have uh, for the balance of the time we have here till about 5 of 11. I'm going to bust people who make speeches, I'm afraid, because... We want to take as many questions as we can in the time available, and I'll go side to side, not discriminate on one side or another side, if that's okay. Why don't we begin here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I, uh, I'm the grandmother of two children that need a lot of help. Okay. I'm raising one of them that's autistic with a mental disability. Yes. I have a 14-year-old grandson that was sexually abused. He had two meltdowns last year, and that happened clarity at one time, and a different annex at the second time. The school, I was fighting with the school because I wanted them to help him because he has mental problems, so is his mother. Right. And the school sent him to the alternative school instead of helping him. So yeah. I went to the board meeting to beg them to put him in a hospital. He needed to be in a hospital, not in the alternative school. We, we have an opportunity for people, I want to remind people, we have an opportunity to tell your stories, actually, and have that be up on the website. Can I just ask okay, if I you have a, do you have a question? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's my question. There's a bill here that they said it passed. The school refused to recognize that he has mental problems. Right. So they're just punishing him and they're punishing me because now I'm barren from going to the school. Right. I have to hire an attorney because they saw. What I mean is right. they do not recognize the mental illness and my 14-year-old grandson, and I don't know where right. to well, and, what, and so this is a, a, it's a great question. Right. That it really is a question that a lot of people in a comparable situation might have because you think I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do. And the help I'm supposed to be getting, I'm not getting. So if you're in that situation, Ed, what do you do? I, I, I do appreciate that question very much. What I would like to encourage you to do is go to your local NAMI affiliate organization and ask for a free class called NAMI Basics. Yep. NAMI Basics is a very short six-session course that will educate uh, grandmothers and parents and family members, caregivers, on what 
symptoms relate to mental illnesses. They provide you with a new vocabulary to communicate it more effectively with physicians yep. and with teachers. But does it also give you the means to know if you're attempting to get help or asking for help and you're being rebuffed? They if you're can, running into the wall, does it then tell you? NAMI basics ne instructors ne next steps. are taught to help people find Good. assistance in the school setting. NAMI basics. NAMI basics. Got it, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Clayton Travis with Texans Care for Children. I just first want to thank our panelists for being here today and supporting this cause. And yep. uh, thank you to the Texas Tribune for your ongoing coverage of mental health issues. Sure, thanks. What's your question? Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, first, many people and legislators don't realize that the Medicaid program is the largest payer for children's mental health services in the state. Uh, and I'm curious for the panelists, what impact would expanding the program to a million parents and single adults have on children? So you're parents? asking the question that is on sort of the minds of a lot of people and has been from the beginning of this last session. Why don't we take advantage of the opportunity to expand yeah. Medicaid? Th this is a complicated question. It's fraught with politics. There, you know, mm -hmm. as Stacy understated, this is a conservative state. Elections have consequences. We've elected conservative people to the legislature and, and state leadership. They've opted not to expand. Okay. Um, uh, and there's questions about even if we did expand whether Medicaid is working adequately or if the program is broken, if we'd be essentially buying into in a bigger way a, prog a program that doesn't necessarily uh, work. So it's, it's fraught with all kinds of, of controversies and, and, and politics. Um, jump in here, weigh in here quickly. What do you think, Melissa, on this question of uh, what the impact of expansion of Medicaid might be? What would the trade-offs be? Well, I, I th certainly think the cost of care for families is one of the barriers to right. access. Um, and so I think we have to have a discussion about how do we make care affordable? Is that through a Medicaid expansion? Is that through more general revenue right. funding? Is that through a different a Texas-based solution to our uninsured problem? Right. Um, but I think we have, to, we have to have a real discussion about the impact of, of the cost of care. You, come, you, you have a personal view of what we should do as a state? I don't have a personal view on that. You may be the only person who doesn't have a personal view. <laughs> Dr. Thies, you have a personal view on this you want to share with us? Well, I, I think it's important to expand Medicaid or do something equally effective. Right. Because just treating the children in a poor family yeah. is, yes, it helps. Yeah. But it doesn't get you there. It doesn't affect the economy. It doesn't help that family improve their situation. Right. It doesn't help the workforce. We need to be supporting our citizens so that they can become productive, so right. that they can have an opportunity to participate. And by not doing something, expanding Medicaid or some other or some initiative. Or some kind of, it, this Texas solution, right, that we hear about? We are spending more for less results. Okay. We had at least one person who agreed with you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just to say, um, THA actually has taken an official position to support coverage expansion in whatever form or shape that takes because coverage equals access. Access yep. is important. Yes. Right. Um, so just FYI. Ma'am. Hi. Um, Hi. My, um, I don't have as much a question as a comment. There was an example of the one piece of candy in the candy dish, and now we have two. Um, in my family, we had good insurance, we had great doctors, yeah. we had a lot, but I really have to mention that one example of that only one piece of candy in the candy dish are the families out there who feel their only way they can get care for their children is to relinquish their parental rights right. to what the about state. The, and that is yeah. an outrageous thing to happen yeah. in a state that is... So much our, our faith is very important to us yep. and I really don't understand how we got to that point but that is that is an example of only one piece of candy this this ed is a, is, a, is certainly a challenge you know if you're mm -hmm. so desperate for for some kind of help but the solution is something that runs completely counter to what you're able to bear you're put in a terrible position right absolutely yeah and there was legislation that addressed that yeah. this past session uh, this uh, legislation is uh, not requiring people to relinquish. You know, the little list that the state used to keep on right. people who did relinquish right. is now inappropriate and illegal. Okay. Uh, and funding was provided uh, to help families like that. And, and it goes back to one of the comments I made earlier about the residential treatment. 
Right. You know, there is funding for that. Is it, is it adequate? I think our statistics will show it is not. But, it's, but it but is a start. It's a step it in the right direction. It opens the door and it allows us to create something that we can build on yep. and then increase the budget in the next session. Good. Hello, ma'am. Hi, thanks for having me uh, ask a question to you. I was thinking of like collective impact and I was thinking of community health workers if they're trained on on mental health, but also um, the faith-based organization, churches. I mean, what what um, could we do? Because I'm a professional, but I'm also an aunt, uh, a sister, a friend with uh, individuals with mental health, and you know, I'm yep. in charge. So how can I how can I help? Right. How can our churches help? Right, Doctor Thies, this is actually kind of a version of what we talked about earlier. That everything used to be taken care of at the government level. But now it's community organizations, it's faith-based organizations are having to step in and sort of essentially replace what was once coming from government. Uh, those services sometimes have to come from non-government organizations, right? I think that historically they've always played a significant role but it, and it, they've but always it, been a big one part. One sense is maybe that they're having to play more of a significant role now as the funding challenges and the competition for funding gets... I think that what's, what's happening is that the market within which we work and right. the communities within which we work are becoming larger and more complicated right. and the silo funding and yep. the fact that this church is in this neighborhood and this church is in that neighborhood right. and we all are trying to do too much with too little. So coordination and cooperation yep. is at the heart of this right. and, and what we need to do is have these organizations plug in to each other and to existing Gets back service to co organizations. Co coordination. Right. Yeah. Mental, mental health first aid is just a huge step forward in being able to help people to recognize problems. This training is going to be available all over the state. Within the next six months, you're yeah. going to see it blossom. Mental health first aid will help your organization to be able to put this together. Yeah. You know, Dr. Thies, uh, Stacy makes a really interesting point. This is a very fast-growing state. We've gone from 20 million people in 2000 to 26 and a half, almost 27 million today. We're adding 1,000 people to the state a day. a day. But they're not bringing water, transportation, public education, or mental health services with them when they come. So these resources, physical and social infrastructure resources, of which one is mental health services, are being strained, right? Yes. That growth is making it harder and maybe making it more necessary. Correct. That outside groups get and, involved. And because we've, we have continually mm. underfunded mental health since 2003, I mean, before then, we've always been right. low per capita. This just makes the, those scarce Exacerbates resources the problem. go, yeah, uh, exactly. Ma'am. Uh, my name is Eileen Jones, and I'm coming to you as a child. Am I asking you a question? Who is in school? And I know that there is a stigma, so I have to go to the nurse's office, I have to get my medication, yep. whatever. I know that medically there's a medical record and I don't want to take my medicine anymore because if in the future when I want to become a police officer or a public servant Great or question. whatever, I will have my medical records looked at. So I'm telling my mother, I'm not going to take this yeah. medicine. How do we help those children? Right. How does the stigma not roll forward and how do you tell people it's, a, it's important to get treatment without it being this black mark on you in the future? Right. Melissa, what do you do about that? I think that's part of the, a, the, having a, a discussion about the reality of mental illness in our families. Um, we need to be at a place, it used to be where you couldn't talk about having cancer. No one talked about it. Right. if they had cancer. It was right. a black mark on you. Or no one talked about having HIV. And those discussions are now very open. And so how is it that mental health continues to remain one of those things that you have to be embarrassed about and not talk about? And I think that the fact that we have now in many ways said this is an illness just like cancer, just like HIV, just like diabetes. When, we, when people really believe that, then things will really change. Yeah. But the fact that children are still <clears throat> embarrassed to take medication at school, the fact that people in your family still don't want to tell anyone and they don't really want to take their medication because they think they'll be okay, I think that says we haven't had enough conversation to make people comfortable. Ma'am. Good morning. Um, I'm a graduate student pursuing my master's in mental health counseling. Yep. And the question that I have is, um, with the great need for the outpatient services and the lack of providers, are there any plans for um, 
for funding to train, especially at the grassroots levels. I'm in thinking in particular for peer support. What do you all know about that available funding source? There is availability for uh, uh, funding for peer support. Great. Both training and then also the Medicaid program now pays for uh, peers to provide services um, under the Medicaid rehabilitation. So there is, there is actually funding available. That's good yes. news. And Great. so we are seeing an increase in the number Great. of peers trained. I think we may have time just for one more or possibly two more. So let me go ahead and take one here and then try to come back over here. And again, if you're not able to get your question asked, I apologize. We're out of time. Ma'am. Mine may require a very short answer. Okay. It's a very practical question. Yeah. I work in an after-school care program. Yes. Last week, a parent came to me and said, my son's been out of Laurel Ridge Hospital for about a month. He's been on medication and I'm out of the medication. I did have enough wherewithal to say, what is he being medicated for? And she said, ADHD and schizophrenia. Now, I wished I had abilities, information yeah. that I could have given her to direct her to help get that medication. Right. right. So that's my first question. And the second is that I'm wondering, what's going to happen in our program? What is, how is this child going to behave? And I thank you for NAMI basics. I think I'll try to yeah. participate in that. But if there are other community services that I could have referred to, it would have right. been great. Where do you send a parent in that situation? Um, I would call the local mental health authority, which in Bear County is the Center for Healthcare Services. They can give guidance and on And they can give guidance on, on that, On what yes. to do. I think you ask a great question about what happens when that kid comes back. What do you do? How do you integrate? It's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, let's make this one the last one. Ma'am. Hi. My name is Diane Kosnowski, and I'm a personal advocate for special needs families. Yep. Um, many families have sought out resources for meeting roadblocks by agencies not returning something as simple as a phone call. And having the fear of reaching out because of their fear of rejection, they don't want to come forward once again. Yep. What is the plan to rebuild trust in order to establish an open dialogue on mental health with children and regain these, these parents back into a system that right. has completely failed their children? and they're trying to regain that trust so that yeah. they can come forward once again. How do, you, how do you persuade people that it's okay to try again? Yeah, good. You relate. You relate to them. Uh, again, I encourage everyone to contact your local NAMI organization. NAMI is where families live with the issues. We've walked the shoes you're in. We understand where you're coming from. We can help connect you to specific individuals in the community who helped me. And, and that, those are connections made. But in a broader sense, across the state, our legislators also appropriated within this $305 million funding for public announcements, for public education, to try to change the nature, to try to to discuss and, and impact this stigma. Right. And so we need to make sure that these public announcements are effective, we pay attention to it, yeah. uh, and it talks to the needs of children. In some ways, we end the program here where we began with better education. Exactly. As the most important thing that we can do to educate the community about the, the, the realities of what's going on here and to make the stigma go away and to give people the means and the wherewithal to talk about the stuff more out in the open, that kind of is, uh, that's a, a really hopeful sign, I think, and it's a good place to end. I think we had a wonderful discussion. I was honored to have the opportunity to lead it. Please join me in thanking, again, our panelists, Stacy, Dr. Thies, Ms. Rowan, and Ed. Thank you very much. We'll turn back over to Fred. Good. Thank you. I enjoyed it.